Okay, uh, we're going to continue our uh, look at primitivism. Now, I ended the last video by discussing the uh, sceptical problem for colour primitivism. A very similar objection, um, or I guess another, uh, perhaps a slightly different way of, of running this sort of sceptical argument, appeals to the evolution of colour vision. And the charge here is that even if there are colours in the primitivist sense, evolution cannot be sensitive to them. So uh, our perception of colours is likely to be uh, radically mistaken, which would uh, essentially be an anti-realist kind of uh, view. So the, basically primitivism uh, entails uh, anti-realism, which is obviously not what the primitivist would, would want, being a realist. Uh, OK, so why can some organisms perceive colours? Well, colour vision presumably uh, evolved to help us to discriminate objects, um, perhaps help us to spot predators, uh, helps us to quickly determine which fruits are ripe for eating and so on. Uh, now, an important point here is that colour vision, like all other traits, did not evolve to help us detect how things actually are, but only to promote survival. Uh, I mean, that's ultimately why uh, anything, any, 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 any biological trait ultimately has evolved to promote survival. Anything that has arisen by natural selection must have benefited survival in one way or another. So we can expect colour vision to detect the facts. We can expect colour vision to uh, show us how things actually are, only if there is a benefit in doing so. And the argument against primitivism is that if colours are these non-physical, irreducible properties, then there's no benefit in tracking facts about colour. Uh, so here's the, the sort of basic evolutionary argument against primitivism. First, colour perception emerged through evolution. Uh, second premise, if primitivism is true, evolution is not truth tracking with respect to colour. Uh, conclusion, if primitivism is true, colour perception is unreliable. Uh, so we're not justified in supposing that any of our colour perceptions accurately represent the external world. What do we mean by truth tracking? Well, a process is truth tracking if we can expect that process to deliver reliably true beliefs. Suppose I form beliefs by consulting a crystal ball. You ask me if I know what the weather is going to be like tomorrow. I look at the crystal ball and say it will be stormy. Now, I might be right. I mean, maybe it is stormy. Maybe it will be stormy tomorrow. But we would assume that this is a result of luck. The crystal ball is an off track process. Consulting a crystal ball does not reliably produce true beliefs. If you were to use the crystal ball to determine the weather again, you'd probably get the wrong answer. We say that a process of forming beliefs is truth tracking if it produces true beliefs reliably, not just as a matter of luck. So this second premise says that if we accept primitivism, uh, then we have, we have reason to suppose that our capacities for detecting colour will be about as reliable as a crystal ball. Um, so... Uh, the question is, why should we assume that evolution is not truth-tracking with respect to colour? Well, as noted, evolution is truth-tracking only where tracking the truth improves survival. Uh, so, consider motion perception. It's obviously helpful to know when things are moving and how fast they're moving. If you see something moving towards you very quickly, that's a good sign that you either need to uh, run or perhaps duck out of the way. It might be a tiger jumping out at you or it might be a rock that somebody has thrown. Um, so we need to we need to know, we need to have some idea of how fast things are moving relative to us. Similarly, you can say depth perception. We need to know distances. How far away is the animal that I'm trying to hunt? How far down is that fall? Detecting motion and detecting depth are obviously important to survival. Now let's turn to colour. Uh, consider insects and flowers. Uh, insects and flowers are good examples of co-evolution. They sort of evolve together in a, a mutually beneficial relationship. Insects get food from flowers and as a side effect they help to fertilise flowers. As a result of this relationship, insects evolved to see flowers and flowers evolved to make themselves prominent to insects. Uh, the insects want to find the flowers and the flowers uh, want, as it were, to find uh, the insects to find them. So uh, insects evolved a mechanism that makes certain kinds of flowers prominent to them, uh, and flowers evolved to exploit this mechanism. This is, of course, the mechanism of colour vision. That's uh, the point of colour vision in many insects is to make flowers prominent. As a side effect of making the flower stand out, various other things will also be tinted with colour.
And this is the crucial point. Very plausibly, colour vision in insects evolved simply because of their relationship with flowers. As a side effect, insects see other things as being coloured, the sky, the trees, the water and so on. But the point of colour vision in insects is to make flowers prominent. It doesn't matter what the real colours are. Insects would see flowers as having different colours uh, from, from the, you know, insects would see flowers as being differentiated from the leaves and the earth, even if they actually had the same colours as leaves and earth. Um, uh, insects would see flowers as red or blue or yellow, even if they're actually dull green or dull brown, because insects need to differentiate flowers from the rest of the environment. Indeed, insects would see flowers as vividly coloured, even if there were no colours at all. Uh, why? Because it's selectively useful for them to see flowers this way. It improves their survival. And all the other colours that they see in the sky or ocean or ground or whatever are mere side effects of this. Uh, now, maybe this story about insects and flowers isn't completely accurate. There are probably other things that insects use colour vision for. But you can see that the argument uh, generalises. There's no, there's no connection to, to truth or facts here. Uh, the point is just to make, for instance, to make flowers prominent, and it's really irrelevant what the actual colours are. Let's take another example. Our ancestors were dichromatic. Uh, Yellow-blue discrimination evolved a very long time ago, about 500 uh, million years ago or so. Among animals, uh, among mammals, trichromacy evolved only in the last 65 million years and is still very rare. Only a few mammals have red-green discrimination. So why did our ancestors, why are, we, why are we lucky? Why did our ancestors develop red-green discrimination? One possibility, which may not be true, but it's a plausible story, is that our ancestors were tree dwellers. These tree dwelling ancestors needed to distinguish ripe fruit from the trees because ripe fruit provides much better nutrition. But they were living in uh, jungles, in forests, and under dichromatic vision, everything in a forest looks pretty much the same. Here's an image of a, a kind of foresty scene, uh, uh, how it might look to, uh, to some, something with dichromatic vision. This is a this kind of thing a, a dog might see uh, if it was to look at this foresty scene. Now let's add red-green discrimination to this image. Suddenly, it becomes much easier to navigate. We can see these uh, raspberries very easily. We can distinguish the raspberries that are good to eat from the ones that are not yet ripe. I mean, these uh, kind of yellowish ones aren't, aren't ready to eat yet. We can very easily see the, the, the raspberries that are ripe to eat. Plants that are high in uh, carotenoids, uh, which look red or orangey, they suggest ripeness. And, and that stands out against the more chlorophyll heavy leaves, which are green. Red-green discrimination allows us to see the differences that are hidden under yellow-blue dichromatic vision. And the crucial point, of course, is that massive illusion would have been just as useful for this, or perhaps even more useful for this, than veridical perception. It makes no difference what the colours of the trees and fruits really are. All that matters is that they look sufficiently different to us. Perhaps the leaves are really red and the ripe fruits are really green. We don't need to know that. All we need to promote survival is to see a distinction. Indeed, even if the leaves and the fruits were objectively the same colour, or objectively had no colours whatsoever, we could expect creatures like us to evolve to distinguish them, because it's in our interest to do so. The argument then, the evolutionary argument, is that the actual colours in the world, even assuming that there are colours in the world, aren't going to make any difference to the colours that we perceive. It, it, it would be a fairly astonishing cosmic coincidence if the objective distinctions between colours just so happen to match the distinctions that are useful for us to make. So, that's the evolutionary argument against primitivism. Perhaps the most serious objection to primitivism is the variation in colour perception. Uh, and variation arises in a number of ways. First of all, there is significant variation in the judgments of unique hues. Uh, as I've mentioned several times, unique hues are those hues that appear as pure hues. Unique red is a red that's neither bluish nor yellowish. Uh, now, what exactly appears as a unique hue 
is different for different observers. What looks pure red to one person might look slightly yellowish to another. The range is particularly striking with green. Uh, Sheffrin and Werner in the paper Loki of Unique Hues Throughout Lifespan studied a number of normal observers. So uh, normal observers are people who are able to make all the normal colour discriminations. The range of judgments of unique green was 49 nanometers, which is 16% of the visible spectrum. That's an enormous range of variation. Indeed, the range of variation actually overlapped with the range of variation of, uh, of unique blue. So this is a striking range of, of variation. Uh, one of the primary reasons for this is that vision changes with age. In, partic in particular, the lens gets uh, gradually more yellower uh, and absorbs more shorter wavelength light. So less of the short wavelength bluer light reaches the retina. What appears unique green to a very old person will appear significantly more bluish to a younger person because the younger person is getting more of the shorter wavelength light. Uh, still, it's worth bearing in mind that even if we look at people in the same age group, there's still significant variation in judgments of unique hues. And this raises the question, who's right? Um, I mean, it might be worth comparing this to something like shape. If you asked people to uh, ask people to uh, distinguish a number of different triangles, right? So you show various drawings of triangles, and you ask people to pick out the pure, purest triangle, the triangle with the fewest defects, you know, the triangle with the straightest lines. It's unlikely that there would be all that much variation. Um, yeah, they, they'd probably agree on which one. Uh, now, the unique binary distinction is an important feature of color. Some colors are pure, others are mixtures, but which ones? I say an object is unique green, you say it's yellowish. How do we decide who's right? We face the following problem. The light that appears unique green to me uh, appears yellowish green to you. Either my perceptual data is mistaken, or your perceptual data is mistaken, or we're both mistaken. And it looks like it's completely arbitrary to say that my perception is veridical and yours is wrong, or that your perception is veridical and mine is wrong. Remember, we're both normal perceivers. The natural conclusion would therefore be that we're both wrong. And the argument generalises. It's arbitrary to suppose that any particular group of people are correctly perceiving the colour. The second way of running this kind of argument uh, is that colour perception differs in different species. There are species that are dichromatic, who have only two types of photoreceptor dogs, as we've mentioned, are essentially red-green colourblind. So what looks red to us will look a sort of darkish yellow to a dog. What looks green to us may look light beige to them. Anybody who wants to say that humans must be privileged because we have more photoreceptors than dogs will want to reflect on the many tetrachromatic species, which have a fourth type of photoreceptor. Uh, if colours are primitive properties, if they are as they appear, then which species is correct? Um, and we need to emphasise, of course, it's not just that tetrachromats can see more colours than us. It's not, for instance, that they see the same uh, visible wavelength plus some other colours in uh, the ultraviolet parts of the spectrum, say, some unimaginably purpley purples. Tetrachromatic vision and, and trichromatic vision are, are incommensurable. Recall the image of... Uh, human vision compared to dog vision that I showed in the first video, showed the spectrum of a human and the spectrum of a dog. That's the kind of relationship there is between human vision and hawk vision, except human vision is the impoverished one. So, you know, who is perceiving colours correctly? We say that an object is red, the dog sees it as dark yellow, the hawk sees it as something else entirely. Who's right? So we have uh, variation in unique hues and massive variation across different species. How can the primitivist accommodate this? Well, one attempt at a response might be to say that two organisms perceive the same colour in different ways. The phenomenal difference is a difference in how that colour appears. Both the human and the dog see red. It's just that red appears differently to a human than it does to a dog. By comparison, if you look at a circular coin face on, it will appear circular, whereas if you look at it tilted, it will appear elliptical. In both cases, you're looking at the circular object, it just presents itself differently. However, notice that whatever the merits of this response, it denies that colours just are how they appear. So while this might be plausible for a reductive uh, physicalist, it's less plausible for a primitivist.
In fact, I'm not sure that this even counts as a form of primitivism, because it entails that red is actually reducible to something else, even uh, if it's reducible to a, some higher level property. Red isn't what it seems to be. When we, uh, what we actually see when we when we look at a red object isn't isn't red because a hawk and a dog just as le legitimately as we do see the same colour and they see different things. So um, it seems to d deny the basic primitivist claim that um, colours just are as they appear. A second response uh, begins by suggesting that there are colours we can't see. This accounts for the colours beyond the human visual spectrum. Tetrachromats see colours, they just see colours that we can't perceive. This seems reasonable enough, though it, 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 the main problem, uh, of course, is that well, what we see as red, a dog may see as dark yellow. Presumably it can't be both red and yellow. But now we might suggest, well, actually, it can be both red and yellow. This is uh, colour pluralism, and it has been defended by uh, Vivian Mizrahi. Mizrahi suggests that the massive variability of colours arises because objects literally have many colours. Colour pluralism claims that a single surface can be many colours all over at once. For instance, it can be red all over and yellow all over. Consider a lemon. A lemon in daylight appears yellow. In monochromatic light, it might appear red or green or black or even blue. To different species, it might appear some colour that we can't conceive of. According to the colour pluralist, this is because the lemon literally has all of these colours. These colours are all objective properties of the lemon that are perceptually accessible under different conditions. Now, there's nothing controversial about the idea that different properties are accessible under different conditions. If we are uh, colour monists, if we believe that objects have, have uh, one colour, yeah, monism, that's just one colour, then we will probably say that lemons are objectively yellow. We don't always see them as yellow. Sometimes the yellowness of the lemon is hidden, if, for instance, we're viewing the lemon through a blue filter. Colour pluralism simply extends this sort of strategy. Lemons are yellow. They are also red and green and gold and black and so on, though under most conditions these colours are hidden. Uh, Mizrahi also gives the example of using a special light source and special glasses to reveal fingerprints and bodily fluids at a crime scene. What, what we're seeing when we see fingerprints isn't illusory. These are real chromatic aberrations. Uh, there is a genuine colour difference there. It's just hidden under normal perceiving conditions. In the right circumstances, you can reveal these hidden colours. So lemons similarly have lots of well, they have uh, almost they have almost all colours. They're, they're red, green, yellow, gold, blue, and under different conditions, these different colours can be perceived. Um, so one uh, uh, point that we might raise in support of pluralism is that a surface under different lighting conditions can appear to have different colours, yet at the same time appear unchanged. When you view the lemon through a blue filter, which would, I guess, make it black, the phenomenology doesn't suggest that the lemon itself has changed. Um, yeah, that wouldn't that wouldn't be a natural assumption. The lemon looks different, but we would assume that the lemon itself remains the same. Now, this is usually explained by saying that the difference is in how we perceive the object, because we're perceiving the lemon under different circumstances, and this makes it appear differently. Uh, color pluralism accepts this, but just adds that even even in these different circumstances where we're viewing the lemon through a blue filter, perception is veridical. The blue filter uh, doesn't hide the true colour of the lemon, it reveals one of the many true colours of the lemon. And in many ways this makes some sense, I suppose, because viewing the world through a filter isn't really like an illusion. Um, when we view something through a filter, we're still able to discriminate objects properly, we're still able to categorise them properly, so it's not really like being under the grip of an illusion. Uh, anyway, it should be obvious how colour pluralism solves the problem of variation in colour perception. I see the object as unique green, and you see it as yellowish green, because the object really is both unique green and yellowish green. The slight differences in our perceptual systems lead us to access different colours. Uh, and a dog looking at the same object will see it as, I don't know, light beige, because, again, the object really is light beige. The dog has a different 
perceptual system, so accesses a different color. Uh, so this does solve um, really one of the main problems that primitivism faces, but there are a number of worries about plur color pluralism. First of all, the notion that an object can be two or more colors all over at once is is highly counterintuitive. Uh, this this sounds more like something you'd expect to hear in uh, quantum mechanics or something like that. Um, and I mean, just consider right everyday statements like, if an object is red all over, then it's not yellow all over. That seems obviously true. Uh, that seems like a basic fact about the nature of colours. But colour pluralism denies this. And in, and in doing so, it undermines one of the purported benefits of primitivism, which is its agreement with common sense. This is really the main motivation for primitivism. Uh, primitivism captures the common sense view that colours are properties of objects, and it captures the immediate phenomenology of colours, whereas reductionism has problems accounting for various facts about the structure of colour space, such as the unique binary distinction and the opponency structure of colour. Primitivism has no trouble with any of that, because it says that colours just are as they appear, and that's uh, so, you know, that, that one of the benefits of this is that it's, it's, it's just the sort of common sense everyday view. But primitivism's claim to uh, capture common sense looks a lot weaker if the primitivist is forced to accept colour pluralism. Now maybe this isn't really a problem. Uh, personally, I've never cared for appeals to common sense. My view is that the world is a strange place and there's no reason at all why it should match our common sense intuitions. But um, I'm not inclined to be a primitivist in the first place. Uh, I, I would say that if you're not inclined to accept appeals to intuition and common sense, then you know don't be a primitivist. Simple as that. Then you don't have any of these problems. Um, second, colour pluralism seems uh, metaphysically unparsimonious. As you know, uh, Occam's razor tells us not to multiply entities beyond necessity. Colour pluralism massively expands the number of colours. Not only are colours objective properties, but every object has many, perhaps infinitely many, colours. Now one way we might resist this is to appeal to the distinction between quantitative parsimony and qualitative parsimony. Quantitative parsimony is a, is a measure of the number of entities or properties there are. Qualitative parsimony is a me measure of the number of types of entities or properties there are. Suppose uh, one world contains 50 electrons, another world contains one electron and one proton. The world with 50 electrons is less quantitatively parsimonious because there are more entities, but it's more qualitatively parsimonious because those entities are all of the same type. Many philosophers have suggested that only qualitative parsimony is important. There's no injunction on, uh, yeah, there's no requirement to reduce the sheer number of entities. There's only uh, a requirement to uh, be careful with expanding the number of types of entities. Uh, I mean, if a physicist claims to have discovered a new particle, that's a really big deal. Uh, it could revolutionise science. On the other hand, if it's discovered that there are more stars in the galaxy than we thought, well, that's interesting, but that's about all. I mean, that, that's not likely to lead to any major revolutions. I mean, it could do, I suppose, but uh, it, 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 it just as easy. That could just be a kind of interesting, uh, interesting discovery. Whereas discovering a, a new type of entity, a new particle, that's a really major thing. So quantitative parsimony simply doesn't seem to matter all that much. Uh, and if we accept this, then uh, colour pluralism no more violates Occam's razor than standard primitivism. Pluralism merely proliferates um, the number of colours that an entity has, but it doesn't add any new types of properties beyond what the primitivist already believes in. So um, maybe that's not such a powerful objection. A third problem is that perhaps pluralism is too pluralistic. As you know, different situations can lead to completely different colour experiences. Different perceptual systems will lead to completely different colour experiences. Indeed, pretty much any object can be perceived as having pretty much any colour, provided the circumstances are right. Recall the examples of colour constancy illusions given in the first video. A grey square can appear blue or yellow, depending on its surroundings. 
even in so-called normal conditions, different perceptual systems will, will lead to totally different colour experiences. A tetrachromat has totally different experiences to what a, a trichromat such as, such as a human would have. So the worry here is that colour pluralism trivialises the colour property. Every object has every colour. But that's just to say that colour doesn't really track any distinctions in the world. Uh, so I, I guess the point is this. If we want to say that X is red and Y is green, then the words red and green have to mean different things. But if it turns out that every red thing is also green and every green thing is also red, indeed, it, you know, if it turns out that every object has every colour, then it looks like we're not really tracking any distinctions anymore. The property is trivial. To say that an object is red is like saying that it's self-identical. Well, obviously, because everything is self-identical. Uh, and a, a related point here is that we do, in fact, use colour language to draw important distinctions. So it seems that the colours that actually matter to us can't be these objective pluralistic properties. If I say the getaway car was blue, I'm communicating useful information. This information is not remotely useful if every car in the world is blue. So even if we accept colour pluralism and we think that objects have these pluralistic colours, it's arguable that, that these colours aren't really colours, or at least they aren't the colours that we talk about in everyday life. Remember the goal of primitivism, the, the goal of any philosophy of colour, is ultimately to explain what it is we're talking about when we talk about colour. When I say the getaway car was blue, what property am I referring to with the word blue? And arguably colour pluralism um, doesn't explain this at all, it, it changes the subject. Colour pluralism isn't really a theory about colours as we understand them. So that might be a problem. A final, final problem with pluralism is that it seems that pluralism rules out the possibility of certain kinds of colour illusions. In a certain respect, um, if we accept colour pluralism, then we have to say that we have a perceptual system that never misfires, indeed cannot misfire. Suppose I stare at a red light, and then I look away at a white wall and see a greenish afterimage. Now we'd want to say that this is a colour illusion, but according to the colour pluralist, the surface that I'm looking at genuinely is greenish. The white wall is also greenish. One of the conditions under which you can perceive the greenishness of the wall is when you have fatigued your eyes on a red light. So the afterimage is not an illusion. In, in fact, it's not really even an afterimage. You're straightforwardly perceiving one of the colours of the wall. And, I mean, and this point generalises. Whatever colour you perceive, under whatever circumstance you're in, whenever you perceive um, a colour, you are accurately perceiving the colour of, of the object in front of you. If I look at a table and um, hallucinate a rat on the table, well, although the rat is a you know, insofar as I think that there's a rat on the table, I am mistaken. But insofar as I'm sort of seeing patches of um, black and grey on the table, well, that's absolutely veridical. That perception is accurate because the table really is those colours. Um, so it seems that there's certain kinds of colour illusions are just not possible. Uh, colour illusion and colour hallucination is, is ruled out, and that seems like a, a very strange conclusion. So colour pluralism um, saves primitivism from, from some of the problems posed by variation in colour perception, but it does have some pretty major costs uh, of its own that would need to be dealt with. Uh, now, uh, I want to note one final objection to primitivism, which is that primitivism is essentially just an ad hoc manoeuvre designed to save the implausible theory of colour realism. The charge against colour realism is that there are serious problems explaining what colours could be given the facts of colour science. Uh, prima facie, colour science would suggest anti-realism, and indeed most colour scientists are anti-realists. The colour primitivist responds to these problems by saying that colours are irreducible and basically unanalyzable. Um, so, of course, we don't find colours at the physical level because colours are colours emerge at a higher level. So, they they wouldn't be seen at the physical level. The nature of colour is revealed in perception. There's nothing more to be said about it than that. The problem is, it seems that this kind of strategy 
could be used to save all manner of ridiculous properties. <coughs> Consider heat. Today we say that heat is the amount of energy transferred between regions of a different temperature, where temperature is determined by the uh, mean kinetic energy of the molecules, at least in a standard gas. We understand very well, on a physical level, the nature of heat, temperature, energy and so on. Now, in the past, there was a theory of heat known as caloric theory. This theory held that heat is a compressible fluid called caloric that can flow from body to body, and hot things are those with high caloric pressure, cold things are those with low caloric pressure. This is quite a powerful theory. Um, if we bring two uh, objects with different caloric pressures together, caloric will flow from the higher pressure to the lower pressure until the pressures stabilise. Different types of material have different capacities for absorbing caloric, which is why different materials heat up at different rates. Uh, water can absorb uh, a lot of caloric without the caloric pressure changing much, whereas uh, caloric pressure increases quite rapidly in many metals such as aluminium, which is, which is why um, you know, water absorbs a lot of heat without, uh, without feeling so, so hot, whereas uh, metal, if you heat it for just a little bit, it will burn you. Uh, now, this is a fairly natural theory, and it makes a lot of sense. Notice as well that arguably caloric isn't just a theoretical postulate, it can be perceived directly. When you put your hand on a hot stove, you can literally feel the caloric fluid flowing into your hand, uh, and the pressure may be high enough to damage your hand. When caloric uh, reaches particularly high pressures, it can begin to glow, so you can actually see it. Of course, caloric doesn't exist. Today we explain sensations of heat by appealing, to, by appealing to physical properties such as kinetic energy, and there is no place in physics for caloric fluid. But now imagine a rather perverse philosopher who says, caloric is a, a simple irreducible property. It exists over and above the physical properties. It is supervenient on physical properties, indeed it's constituted out of them, but it's also something more than them. It emerges at a higher level. If you focus on just the physical properties, of course you won't see any caloric, because caloric isn't detectable on the physical level. Now obviously nobody believes in caloric, but the point is that the strategy of the colour primitivist can be used to populate the world with all manner of, of deviant properties, properties like caloric. Why shouldn't we be caloric primitivists if we're going to be colour primitivists? How do, we, how do we block the move to caloric primitivism? or miasma primitivism, or phlogiston primitivism, or whatever else. So this, you know, if, if this argument for colour primitivism works, uh, why doesn't the argument for caloric primitivism work? Um, so that was colour primitivism, um, and some of the objections that, that the primitivist faces. Uh, Personally, I've never found it to be a particularly plausible theory, but um, you know, maybe you'll see something in it that I don't. Anyway, uh, hopefully you found that interesting. I guess next time we'll be looking at relational theories. But that's all for today. Thanks for watching.